uh, uh, just uh, uh, R parameterized family of k modules. So what PTC is supposed to mean is R parameterized family of a triangulated category which satisfies certain uh, property. And what we are doing in this project is not exactly that. So we actually give a different name, it's called TPC. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the main result is uh, the following. Uh, so given the triangulated persistent category, we, we have to define that. Uh, and for any subset of the object set. Of this, yeah, I for this second variant. Sorry, here, here's something. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, so give, give a triangulated persistent category and for any subset of the object set, you can define at least two quantity. One is called fragmentation pseudometric DF, which is a pseudometric on object set. And the other is a called categorical entropy of a functor of a category. And this is a, this is called HF. Um, this HF is more or less like a growth rate or any other equivalent name. And this HF is defined from DF. Um, and once you have a pseudo metric, you can uh, talk about the topology that's induced by this metric. So we make this object set to be a topological space. And we can verify that this space is an H space. Uh, now you can probably ask a lot of questions. Uh, since it's topological space, how about other uh, topological property? Um, unfortunately, we don't know much about that. We should, but we haven't tried enough in this direction. And since it's uh, um, pretty uh, hard to uh, explore in this direction because of the complexity of this definition DF, you, you will see this in the later of this talk. Uh, but what we are able to do is to verify uh, from- Excuse me, what is H space? H space is a, 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 it's like the, the loop space. You have a, Mm -hmm. uh, a product structure like uh, like a Charles solvent product will give you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. So what 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 we can do is to verify from both in algebra and geometry. There are indeed a lot of examples of uh, TPC. Uh, and the so structure are, is direct sum, I guess, right? Uh, sorry. The structure is product structure is taking direct sums. Uh, in our case, yes. Uh, in general, it's not. And also you need some, some identity uh, stuff to, to, to make sure that this is continuous. Okay, so here's some list of some examples of TPC. Um, I think the most successful one probably is the A, the first one. Uh, if you ignore the filtered, this is actually a classic algebra, algebraic result that any homology category of a, a pre-triangulated DG category is triangulated. So well, what we can do is to uh, upgrade this uh, pre-triangulated DG category to be a filtered uh, version, and then verify that the homology category of this filtered version is actually a TPC. So this A actually provides a large family of algebraic example of a TPC. Of course, there are some other examples like B and C come from like, simple geometry, and D come from algebraic topology, and E has something to do with minor symmetry and the in progress of, the, of course. Um, and uh, in this talk, uh, we will only focus on A, and I will leave uh, any like, application of our, th our theory in the discussion. It's kind of a, it's a little shame that we haven't found any quick uh, application uh, of our theory in like, simple geometry. Our potential aim is to study like B, example B. Well, the object set is a Lagrangian sum manifold. They can talk about the distance of Lagrangian sum manifold. It, uh, so our work will be some like, algebraic upgrade of this sh shadow metric from the recent work by Biron, Cornell, and Shalukin. Uh, um, but we haven't uh, get there yet. Uh, we are still in, in progress. So uh, what, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, talk will be some like foundational things for the theory. So first define something called persistence category. And this will be an underlying category of TPC. And then after that, uh, well, there will be some proposition of TPC which lead to the, the quality of DF and HF. Uh, we'll define that. And uh, there's something interesting here, like uh, any TPC will induce another category called limit category. So, so you should have this impression that TPC is not like the triangulated uh, category in a classic sense, but in the limit category is. So for any uh, potential application, this limit category is uh, probably more useful and applicable than the TPC itself. And if we still have time, we'll talk about this uh, example A. Um, and so this example is not uh, completely new, right? At least most of the name is, uh, is a stand topic. Uh, but once you put a filter, the word filter there, every small piece is need some modification. Uh, um, if we have time, we'll talk about this. And if not, we'll uh, skip it. Uh, it's, a, it's also a technical part. 
Okay, so um, uh, before I start the definition of uh, uh, the first one, persistent test, do you have any questions? Okay, so I will uh, uh, start uh, from the beginning. What's the definition of a persistence category? It's a uh, <clears throat> right. So um, okay, so well, it's it's very much like a, the a categorical uh, story about persistent morphism. So let's see. R is a, a category. A view R is a category, and the morphism set is a, a one object only if the first is smaller than the second one. Otherwise, is a empty set. And it's admit some additive structure, a RS goes to R plus S. And then a category is called persistence category. If I, for any object A and B, I have a functor EAB from this category R to the category of vector space over K, um, then the home set of A and B in this category is a pair. Well, this R comes from this R. So EABR will be just a vector space. And this F is a vector in this uh, vector space. It's a pair. It's a collection of all such pairs. And I will use this notation, M, O, R, A, B, and the uh, upper R here. To uh, This is more conceptual, uh, conceptually more understandable notation. It means that this home set is filtered by this R and uh, uh, call this morphism at level R. And when I say at level R, it really means uh, uh, smaller or equal to R. You should view this as like a sub-level set. Okay, and then the uh, pair is somehow uh, is more concisely denoted as a bar of F, and there's a ceiling function tells you exactly which level R you're looking at this uh, element. Okay, so uh, uh, for those people who know what persistent module is, this is basically the, uh, uh, the home set is a per persistent module. Okay, then in a category, you need composition, right? So what does this composition mean? So it is just a composition. It's, uh, it's nothing mysterious, but you should be careful, careful about this uh, filtration. So the filtration just behave like an additive way. R S goes to R plus S. And also because of this EAB is a functor, right? So for any R and S, there's a map I S is at the beginning mentioned here. So from a lower level set to a higher level set, there exists a map, well-defined map. It's induced by this uh, I R R prime. Uh, and the same thing for this uh, BC, morphism of BC and morphism of AC. And this diagram just means that you compose first then you push forward by this, uh, this map. It's the same as you push forward by the map and you compose. This is probably the most natural thing you can do. And um, uh, okay, so uh, that's the definition of what persistent category is. And uh, um, uh, right, so as I mentioned that this EAB is uh, uh, roughly speaking just a persistent K module, but without, so when people talk about persistent K module in different literature, it uh, has different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, here there's almost no condition. It's just a R parameter family of vector space. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I, I do not have any plan condition here. And this map I R S induce this map called uh, structure maps, uh, persistent structure maps. And when people talk about persistent K module, an uh, important thing that you cannot uh, avoid is, uh, is something like a bonus you can get from here. It's always there that exists a shift. You can shift your parameter R uh, from this R, from R, uh, okay, T goes to T plus R, and then it will get a new persistent module a, as a shift of the, the old one. Okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the definition of our persistent categories. Uh, um, now, uh, if I give you a persistent category, there are two categories that you can actually get from persistent category. One is called C0. Well, what's the definition of C0? It's a new category, the same object, but you are not considering like the entire family of this vector space for the home set. You consider only like the zero level set. Can I look at the previous slide again? This is yeah. so. So what's the difference of, I mean, what's the difference of telling that the home sets just admit a filtration? And this is the same thing as just putting a filtration on the home sets or? Yeah, yeah. the filtration comes from the way that I, I, I defined, like uh, parameters by R. And this okay. filtration is given by this R. Okay, okay. No, but you also have persistent morphisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's not that's just the, the, main, the main point, right? So yes, it's, it's a functor, right? The EAB yeah, is a functor. It's smaller so. R to bigger R than the yeah, and, and also, it's not a, it's not quite a filtration because the maps uh, the 
IRs are not necessarily inclusions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like persistence models. You know, it's like a system of maps like inclusions, but not necessarily inclusions. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so the typical example, like uh, you should view this as a filter chain complex or the homology that is induced by the filter chain complex. Mm -hmm. Then the, in the first case is the map just inclusion. The second case is the, is the map induced on homology by the inclusion, which is not necessarily induced by the inclusion. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let's talk about the C0. C0 is an easier category, which only focus on the level uh, zero. Why the level zero is important or is good, right? Because we we'll go back to the diagram here. See, if I put all the level zero here, this diagram also commutes. So this diagram commutes within the level zero. If you consider any other level, it's probably not. Right? If you consider two, then two plus two is four. It's not close. Uh, this is one, one case. The other case is uh, it's called C infinity. Uh, like we just discussed, right? The morphism set views like a direct system, right? Parameter by R and you have this in, in, induced map. And you can just consider the direct the uh, limit of this direct uh, system for any like, uh, home set. This is roughly speaking, you're looking at what happened at infinity. And this is also a good category. This is basically the in-limit category I mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, and the, uh, uh, in, a remark of that is uh, C0 and C infinity, uh, both of this special category is a pre-additive. So you can, like there's a billion structure, a billion group structure on home set. But the C itself, the persistent category itself is actually not. Okay. This is not like in classic uh, setup. Uh, and also there's another remark that if the object set is only at one point, then like in the classic case, right, the category itself will be identified with a, a persistent key algebra. You are, you are better than persistent key module. Right? You have a composition. And for example, the Hamiltonian Fleur homology is probably a persistent key algebra. Uh, it's a filter, and uh, if you identify with a quantum homology, then quantum product will give you a algebra uh, structure. Okay, um, now this is a category. So when, we, when people talk about category, you also talk about other things, like what's a functor, what's a natural transformation, right? So in order not to make the talk too long, I just very concisely tell you what this is. And uh, this is somehow if you, you can define, almost define this by yourself. So what's a persistent functor, right? It will be some collection of, it's also R parameterized family of maps is a functor, so map the morphism from AB to morphism of FA, FB. But the, again, it is a, everything is the filter, so we have to make sure that it's a, a compatible with like the structure map. So it's just our parameter family of such map. So in other words, if, if you use the language of persistent module theory, it's a persistent morphism. And what should be emphasized is uh, um, R goes to R. There's no change of the filtration. You could define something like a persistent functor with a shift of something, like R goes R plus some number, but we are not do, do, doing this here. <clears throat> this is a persistent functor. Uh, what is a persistent natural transformation if I give you two functor? Now I'm going to allow some shift. And the important thing is that this shift is in R, it's not in R plus. So you can shift up and also shift down. It, it, it depends on what, what alpha you take. And uh, there's a lot of condition here, but the one, of the, one of the condition is uh, it's, an, it's supposed to be, it should be a natural transformation. So when it's evaluated at an object, it will give you a morphism. But I said that is shift alpha. So this morphism does not lie in zero, it lies in alpha. And this alpha is in, in, independent of what's the object that you take. So this is just to give you a family of um, morphisms and uh, some other compatibility property you can expect that compatible with the structure map uh, in some way. Okay, this is, is that. that uh, and. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, in persistent story, like in the future world, uh, there's an important thing called the shift. It's a sort of a naturally obtained from this, uh, this uh, R parameterization. So there's also a very important thing for us is a, is a categorical analog of the shift of a persistent module is defined in the following way. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, right. so, so it's actually a R parameter family of, the, uh, of uh, persistent functors. I would denote this as a, a sigma, a sigma upper R, uh, is a R parameter family. And you satisfy a condition that the, uh, uh, the composition of that, it will be just a sum, R plus S. And uh, okay, so in particular, if uh, S is minus R, then this composition is sigma zero, well, I define sigma zero just, uh, just the identity. And identity is a persistent function. And such that there's some relation of these uh, different functors. Um, they can talk to each other 
by saying that um, uh, uh, there is a natural transformation from uh, sigma r to sigma s uh, with a shift s minus r. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so it's uh, two things. One is the r-parameter family of persistence function, and also between two of them, you can talk about this by natural transformation of shift s minus r. And um, well, it's a natural transformation, right? So by what I mentioned earlier, then whenever you evaluate this natural transformation to an object, you will get a morphism. And this morphism, uh, for, for example, if we from Rs, you will get R0, you will get a morphism from sigma Ra to A. But by, by our convention, uh, this uh, is nice in zero minus R filtration, so it's minus R. Okay. Now there's a more like a, a mathematical it's a much professional way to define this. I just want to give you a, a, a quick impression of what this is. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, now, the reason why I want to mention this shift function is uh, the, in persistent module theory, this shift function actually, actually leads to something important. Like you can see something that's uh, not at infinity, right? So like in the Morse theory, right, you, you will find some object die in, in the middle before you reach to infinity. And some of the, those objects will correspond to something called torsion. Right? Like, uh, and also like a finite bar, you know, the barcode, finite bar will correspond to torsion. Uh, um, yeah, in microlocal shift theory, there are some op shift will define to be something called torsion. Uh, okay, they are, they are all in the same uh, spirit. So what's the categor categorical analog of this? It's something called a cyclic object. Excuse me, John, could you please return back? Yeah. So a uh, shift functor acts from uh, this uh, persistence category to itself or to another category? To itself, it's on C, on this category itself. Because uh, sh uh, shift map uh, sends persistence model to a different persistence model, right? So uh, on the level of persistence model, shift means that you reparameterize the spaces. So strictly speaking, it's, it's a different model. And between them, you have a morphism. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what is shift morphism within the persistence model. It's just persistence morphism, but it was already defined. So, 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 yeah, so I'm missing something. So, what I'm missing? Um, no, sorry, sorry. No, the 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 function is act on the 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 act category itself. Right? It will map to so you have a sigma. So sigma and map, and map some object A to a sigma A. And sigma A will be also an object in this case. Can, can, you write, can you write the formula for the transformation sigma R? What, what is the formula that it satisfies? So you should have something like more R of sigma S A and sigma S B or something like that is something. It should satisfy some identity. Can you write that down the identity? Yeah, I was trying to... Uh... Uh, strange. Why I, I do not find this? Uh, I'm supposed to uh, able to write something right here. Yes. Uh, yeah. Why well, cannot find this uh, on? So uh, okay. So uh, sorry. No, in, in any case, the um, sigma uh, uh, applies on the category, and so it changes from an object A to another object sigma R A, and. Uh, also, it, it's a functor, so it also changes a uh, target of a morphism from B to sigma R B, and then the morphism between sigma R A and sigma R B uh, are also filtered, and then there is a relation that you were saying between the you know like the morphism, uh, you know the usual shift in 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 degrees that you expect. I think, uh, I don't know if you can write somewhere, uh, Jun, but... Uh, yeah, strange, right? I cannot, I, I'm supposed to find this uh, uh, writing in the Zoom, right? I couldn't, I couldn't find it. R changes also object. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Changing objects and uh, basically the uh, the filtration on uh, sigma R A to sigma R B is the same as the filtration from, from mm -hmm. A to B. And if you, if you shift them at uh, different heights, you go from sigma R A to sigma S B, this is what uh, Jun, I think, wanted to write. This is the filtration, something like S minus R between A B, but it's an isomorphism between these two. It's, it's not identity. 
So shift factor does not always exist. So sometimes exists, sometimes. No, uh, it, no, it's, it's, uh, right. So, uh, so we need to. This, this is not a, 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 a ingredient in the definition of persistent cavalry. Sometimes you have to construct it by hand. It's so, not just a shift of more. Hmm? Shift it, of what? It doesn't just send more R. Sorry, it doesn't just change more R to more R plus S. It's something no. more complicated. No, 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 no. Because it, uh, in fact, the best way That's to trigger one. So the best way to think of an example is to imagine that uh, uh, objects are Lagrangians with uh, primitive. And then you want to, the shift on the objects would be changing. F to F plus C. Uh, right, yes. changing the primitive by adding a constant. And if you think like this, you immediately see her, what morphy should be and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So very good. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is really the prototype. It's either in more theory a function to which you add constants or primitives on a Lagrangian to which you add constants and that's a shift. So it's not a canonical functor but in some situations no. it is. Okay. It's, a, it's a significant condition to have it uh, in uh, practice. Yes. It's like this property makes it well defined just like the self functor, no? I mean not well defined up to Unique persistence natural transformation or something like that. Sorry, yeah, I didn't hear what, what, what's the question you asked? Yeah. No, that's okay, never mind. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um okay, so um yeah, I probably should give you the, the regular that that definition of that. But it's a. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, each of these sigma r is an isomorphism. This is the important in some in sense of care. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, right, so I want to talk about this like uh, the acyclic uh, object. So um, uh, it should really select the analog of zero in the classic category. But here we. I have a question: Is this happening at the DG level now, or is it happening at the tra translated level? W which one? The the persistent the category, or uh, like the, is there a differential on the morphism sets? Um, no, in general, no. Okay, but so if you have some some differential, then it will be uh, better. But the differential is not important. The filtration is important. The differential will be be defined with respect to this filtration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so the, okay, so I just say the definition was so the object is is, is R is acyclic. If so, E K is the identity map on K, and uh, well, by definition, the identity map it lies on on the uh, zero level. Then I use the structure map to push this to level R, and I see this R acyclically for this just equals zero. Okay. Um, the reason why I, I put here the definition like this is uh, it's easier to understand. Yeah. But the bad thing of that is uh, uh, look at what's happening here. It's happening, everything's all morphism in level R because they push to R. But when you move away from level zero, when you work with that, you should be very careful because the composition sometimes does not behave well. There's an equivalent definition of that, is to define R to be acyclic in the following way. Uh, and the claim is equivalent. Um, so remember this, this morphism come from the shift uh, for function, right? You the shift function value at K. So this is basically morphism from sigma RK to K by the level minus R and um, well, minus r is below zero, right? I can push this to level uh, zero, and, I, 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 and I can also require this to be equal to zero. And this is another way, an equivalent to define an object is, is r a cyclic. And, uh, and somehow in, in the paper, I think we like this better because it's uh, always below the level r, below all, at level r. So when you work with that, you don't need to worry too much about the composition. And, um, <clears throat> And this notation will appears a lot uh, in this talk. Um, that will just denote this composition as something called an eta kr. And again, I emphasize that this lines in morphism at level zero. So this is, this is a definition of a, a, r acyclic. There is a, this is something you should get used to when, when you talk about the, uh, the, the filter work per persistent things because it's a- it's Sorry, a, yeah. does eta r zero always exist? I thought it was a nitro transformation between some things which right. so you first not always have, exist. So it IR zero that is not, does not always exist. No, uh, you need to first have a shift functor 
and then use that. Yes, and then you have you need yes. to on top of that have a natural transformation. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay, so let me uh, say the following thing. Uh, uh, this is uh, this basic object should be uh, like the, uh, some torsion element in this uh, persistent story. And there's another thing I want to mention is when you when you say something is the same in the future work, you should be very careful at the, at which level is the same. They may be same after a certain level, but they are not the same before the level. So the, the right way to do that is to say something. If I give you two objects in some level alpha, I will see they are equivalent. If uh, uh, <clears throat> they are be the same after you shift alpha. They might not be the same if you're not shift uh, further enough. And, and I denote this f like uh, c equal r g if this f and g are equivalent. And you can show this is an equivalent relationship on the, on the uh, uh, morphism. And use this language, basically, what, what I'm just to talk about in the top, it just means that k is basically if, if the identity map of k is r equivalent to zero. Well, in the classic sense, right, if, if the identity map is zero, then the object is zero. But here is the identity map is not necessarily zero, it is about zero after you shift r. So it's something like a, a refinement uh, of that. Yeah. And the last thing is uh, something about example. Uh, I, my, this example in the previous version is a very long one, I, I shortened it down here. So if I consider a category of all the persistent k modules, maybe I put some condition that it, is, it can be decomposed into a barcode. Yeah then this category actually, actually can be enriched to be a persistent category. Right? So I will leave this as a, some, some exercise. You can try how you do this. You just make sure that the home set is a, a persistent module. But because the, each of the persistent module itself is a filter, right? so it's easy to see that how you can make the home set to be a, a filter um, a, a persistent module. And after you check that, you can associate the shift functor that come from the shift of the persistent module itself and then you can check this is R a cyclic object, which I defined here, are precisely those persistent K modules. Well, if you com com decompose this barcode, which only have finite bars, and the boundary depth, the boundary depth means the length of the longest finite bar is no greater than R. So in this sense that the, the abstract categorical definition that we have will reduce down to something that's very well known and, and uh, as, as expected. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, any question about this? Um, okay, so now I move to the um, TPC, um, as I promised. Example, so, compact Lagrangians, I guess, right? Exact uh, Lagrangians. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> wait, so uh, we, we, when you, we don't see your face when you ask things. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to actually hear it clearly. It is a bit difficult. Uh, Right. So move a bit your screen. All right, it's much better this way. All right, great. Thanks. Okay, so for this TVC, right, as uh, advertised that the first slides, right, TVC is somehow a combination. Now we have something more precise. Well, we, it's uh, based on persistent category and also have a translated structure. So once you have persistent category, you can talk about the, what's the filtration morphisms. You have a number of that. And for translated structure, you have a family of exact triangles. Right? Uh, what is a naive goal is to uh, use the filtration of morphism to associate the weights of the exact triangles with such that certain property uh, satisfy. Right? Yeah. So let me tell you that, uh, uh, so this is like not a rigorous definition, but let me tell you that what we are struggling for the couple of uh, months. Um, so we start from the following naive approach, right? If I give you a triangle, A, B, C, A, uh, here I do not emphasize the shift of the degree, just A. Yeah. Uh, you have morphism F, G, H. What's the natural way that you can associate with, right? For example, you can just add the weight of F, G, and H, filtration of F and G and H. It gives you a number. Then probably this number does not satisfy the property that we want to satisfy. But it's not important. What is the mo most difficult thing is the following, right? So recall that the exact triangles in triangulated structure is closed under the isomorphism of triangles. So you have an isomorphism triangle. So the bottom one is also an exact triangle. But so what is isomorphism means, right? At least it means that you have a inverse map, such a composition is identity. But here is, a, as I mentioned earlier, in the future world, when you see something is the same as identity, you should be careful at which level is identity. Right? Maybe it's not identity before level, maybe it's identity after the level. So there's automatic, automatically there are some number associated to this arrow and similar to all the arrow here. Do you need to count like a, a filtration come from all these arrows? If you count that, then 
what's the definition you defined earlier uh, on the top has to be compared with the definition at the bottom. So this is, we, I think we play with this for a couple of months and we, <laughs> it really bothers us. We cannot come up with, uh, maybe there's a very clever way to do this, but uh, somehow we, we cannot do it. Yeah. Um, there, as I mentioned, the isomorph himself actually made some filtration. So let me just uh, directly say what is our approach. Uh, so uh, our approach is I draw a schematic picture here. I hope it's not uh, uh, completely wrong. Right? Okay, so uh, uh, so here's a, the, the arrow here uh, is the filtration morphisms. We always have that. And uh, at this level is the filtration zero. So what is the TPC itself? You will see a definition in the next slice, but it, it, you will have a category such that below this level zero, everything works just like a classic triangulated category. Okay, you have the triangulate, exact triangle, have whatever you want. Yeah. And the, the weight of those triangles is zero. It's, a, it's zero, okay. And uh, what is the other exact triangle that we, we have in this new, in this TPC? We will enlarge the um, triangle from this triangle to some other triangle called the triangle of weight R. This is a new triangle, we will define that. Yeah. And uh, the weight of R comes from the following, that uh, I will compare this triangle with some triangle in the classic uh, tri triangulated category. And the, the, how do you compare them? It will goes back to some diagram like this, right? But in order to simplify our story, um, to not involve like all the arrows here, it will be too much for us. So we will only compare the, on the cone case. It means that A and A prime and B prime is the same as AB. Only difference is C prime is, is different. So the, then we only compare like two objects. For two objects, I'm able to, I know how to compare them. Like in the language of persistent module, I just compare them as something like R interleaving. Okay, so that's basically the idea. We, have a, we will have a certain classic uh, family of uh, exact triangles with some additional uh, triangle. We will define it by comparing this with some classic one. Okay, this is basically the, uh, how the, the, the TPC should give you this impression. Uh, okay, so let's see how the, all this can be formulated in a precise way. Um, here is the definition of what TPC. Okay, so as I mentioned, the TPC is the underlying category of that is a persistent category. We know how, how to do that. With a shift functor, well, you need to have that. Uh, such that first, when you uh, restrict on the C0 category, meaning that the morphism, only looking at morphism zero, this is triangulated, just like cl classic work. And then for uh, any object X, um, this functor, which is a functor from the category to like category of a, billion, of a vector space. Uh, each of these R, this functor is, uh, is exact. Yeah, I'm not sure how f fundamental this is. This is certainly very important for the, some proof, but this is sort of saying that this is like, they have a R parameters family of a homological uh, uh, functor in, in classic sense. Okay, this is uh, the first uh, uh, condition. The second condition is, uh, is, um, is important. Uh, so um, <clears throat> for any R and any object A, this morphism, so, so again, recall what this morphism is. You, this is come from the shift functor. Right? You have this morphism of sigma R A goes to A, but unfortunately it lies in, in filtration minus R, then you shift up to zero. Then you get like a eta R A. This is basically a morphism at level zero. And uh, again, once you have the morphism at level zero, I was going to say that it embeds into an exact triangle in C zero. So this, this triangle is in C zero, such that this cone position is R A cyclic. Okay, that's all. That's the, the condition for what TPC is. And uh, the second condition should not, you should not feel like worried too much about second condition. The second condition should be viewed as a generalization so of the classic, the uh, axiom, and I cannot recall what's the axiom, maybe axiom one or axiom zero. Uh, like the A goes to A by identity of A goes zero, goes to A is an exact triangle in C, C zero. It should, the second one should be like the refinement of, of the one here. Okay, uh, and um, and this acyclic should be like the analog of, of zero. We have seen it how how, how this works. Uh, um, right. So the theorem of that, just from the definition, is uh, is TBC or the a weighted version of a triangulated axioms. Uh, um, this is, you need to prove that it's a long proof. Um, uh, but it's not exactly the triangulated axioms in the classic sense. There's a, we have to modify the version of that. Uh, um, <clears throat> for example, you have, you have already seen what the, like the TR1 is, right? This is a TR1. This is already given by definition. Uh, 
one, and for this talk, I will only state what's the weighted octahedron epsilon, which is the most related uh, one to us. Yeah. And, and also you should uh, uh, question me in the following sense that when you prove the theorem, there's a serious thing missing from this theorem or the statement, right? When you see that the, it admits a uh, uh, axiom, what kind of triangle, which family of triangle is actually, you, I'm going to verify the, 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 the weighted axiom. That exactly goes back to the tri triangle I mentioned that I'm going to extend the um, classic triangle to some triangle called triangle of weight R. So that's what I'm going to define. And once I define that, I will claim that those triangles will be together with the classic triangle from C0, but will satisfy this weighted version of uh, triangulated axiom. Okay, so here comes the how we uh, define this um, uh, uh, weight R exact triangle in uh, its TPC. Uh, the notation of that is called W uh, delta, weight of delta is equal to R. Okay, so this is, this is a long definition and I actually oversimplified. John, it. excuse I, me. Is yes. there any way at this point to give an example which illustrates the previous definition? Because it's a little bit kind of hard to follow. Uh, so, so, I mean, this item two is uh, interesting and uh, without example, it's completely kind of abstraction. Um, can, can, can you illustrate it? Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, the example of in which level somehow. Uh, so, so, so uh, Leonid, uh, yes, it's easy to give an example. So mm -hmm. you take a Morse function and uh, then you shift it up by a small r. And then you think, okay, I have a, a Morse comparison map between this little shift and the original one. And um, this is an equivalence, but it requires a little energy, it requires energy R. And uh, that's the meaning of the uh, R acyclic uh, notion in the sense that if I take the cone of the shifted Morse complex compared to the initial Morse complex, this will be a uh, homotopy equivalent to zero because uh, it's a cone over a, an isomorphism basically. But I need a little bit of energy because the new critical points will be higher up by uh, li this little r. And so, what is k? So in that case, sigma uh, a is a uh, Morse function. It, you look at a sort of a category, but where the objects are Morse functions. And sigma r a is a Morse function shifted up by r. That is the same function plus a. r. Yes, and k. The third one. K is a cone of the comparison map between the Morse complex shifted up. So it's basically the identity, but it shifts, uh, it shifts the fil filtration from, uh, you know, it shifts the action from the critical point has action uh, in the domain X plus R and it has action uh, say X in the, the domain, right? Mm -hmm. The same function and you just look at the identity. But the identity will shift a bit action and Why when you say it's small r? Why do you say that r is small? Uh, just for, for fun. I can take it big. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's irrelevant. No, I you're absolutely think. right, Claude. Uh, so I take any r and I can shift my uh, function, my domain function, I can shift it by r by adding simply r to the value. And I get the same complex, but it's uh, critical values will be now bigger by r. And I take the identity between the two complexes in terms of point to point, but the action is now shifted by R. When I take the cone over the identity, mm -hmm. I'll have, you know, all the critical points will appear in pairs. One will be the old guy X and the next one will be the one that hits it on top with shift R. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a meaning of uh, what an R acyclic is. And it's exactly what Jun was mentioning before with this bar story, because this is how you, produce bars of height r, easiest way, right? I mean, you take, you know, if, if uh, the Morse function would have zero differential, then it would be directly. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's really the prototype of uh, what r acyclics are. And uh, okay, you can do other examples with shifting uh, primitives and Lagrangians and things like this. If, 
Yeah, I, I, I can give another example that I'm more, in, in the language I'm more f familiar with. So if you are working on the chain level, chain complex level, you can take a filter chain complex, if you know what filter chain complex is, uh, then you can shift the filtration of this filter chain complex. Then obviously the filter shifted by R, right? The filter chain complex, shifted filter chain complex and the original chain complex uh, are interleaved or in, in some language I, I know it's R quasi uh, isomorphism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you can consider the mapping cone, homological mapping cone of this map. There's a well-defined map from one to the other one. Then there's a, some theorem that I think I saw a couple of years ago I proved with my culture that is you can check that the barcode of the mapping cone, well, the length of that is controlled. It's no bigger than some constant times R. Mm -hmm. Okay, then this, and this mapping cone is basically the K. Maybe you, you know, pass to the homology category to be K appears here. It will not be zero. It will capture precisely how, how much difference here. Okay, thank you very much. This helps. Okay. The K is a cyclic in your example, right? But like not R, it's also a cyclic, right? R acyclics are basically a cyclic as well, but can you formulate R acyclic in terms of, you know, the generation of the uh, spectral sequence at certain level or something like that? Uh, probably not. It's okay. uh, so. Mm -hmm. So one way to think about it is that um, uh, some things that are acyclic, it's acyclic if you forget filtrations, of course. Sure, sure. But if you keep in mind filtrations, the question is how much energy you need yeah. to have a homotopy between the identity and zero. That's it. And if you need less or equal than R, then it's R acid. Yes, no, I mean, I, I was wondering if for instance, we have this property, can you conclude that the uh, R page of the associated spectral sequence? Correct. If you have a good spectral sequence there, yes. So it I mean, degenerates at the R page. Correct. So uh, I have to, to move on here. Uh, well, as I said, you have to define another new type of triangle. It's called triangle with R. So it will be some triangle just like this. I just, I, I write down A goes to B goes to C. But instead of A, I'm going to have some shift of A plus minus R. And all the morphism is lines in the uh, level zero. This is actually important. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is uh, like the face of this triangle. I will satisfy a certain property, right? I mentioned that earlier, right? How do you, what, where does this uh, R comes from? It comes from this compar comparison of this triangle with the triangle in the classic sense. So the means says that there exists a triangle in C0, exact triangle in C0, which in classic sense, A goes to B goes C prime goes to A. Well, again, as I mentioned that I'm going, not going to change A and B. A and B is the same. Only the cone part is different, the C prime, such that I will have a following diagram, commutative diagram. Uh, uh, Octa probably will go against the definition a little bit, uh, but this is basically what I said, oversimplified. Uh, okay, so let, me, let me first try to explain what's going on here. Uh, uh, so I, this is the triangle that from the C0, standard exact triangle from C0. And this uh, new triangle I have, what's the difference between C and C prime is that I can find some like interleaving relation here. Like you, you, you have a C prime goes to C, you have another shift of C goes back to C prime, um, by some morphism, phi and uh, uh, psi and phi. And the, the diagram commutes, this small triangle commutes, and the composition of this is behave like the uh, transfer map. Right? But you have, a, well, because of the shift functor, we already have a, a, a natural map from sigma RC goes to C, which is basically the, the famous one that I kept saying. It goes down first and shift up by uh, zero. I should view this as some like interleaving relation between C and C prime. Okay, that's basically the uh, uh, definition of what's the, uh, where, where does the weight R comes from. Uh, now, uh, let me see why, why it is oversimplified. Uh, because we actually need uh, some slightly stronger condition than just to have a pair of map like this. I also need to, to require that this map phi is not just a map, it's in something called R isomorphism. Well, there's a way to define that, which is a little bit like the R interleaving. Um, uh, the, the way to define that well, implies that there exists a such psi. And also I need to fix what psi is. If I choose a different psi, then 
it's, it's not true. I have to, to fix what this, uh, this uh, right, right inverse is. Okay, so this is basically the, um, the but, but for, for this talk, it's real like this, uh, there's some relation between C and C prime, an R interleaving relation between C and C prime. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So um, right. now, once we have this uh, um, uh, exact triangle of weight R, um, then when we go back to uh, what the theorem says that if we consider all those such triangles uh, together with the triangle in the C0, then you can verify that you satisfy a weighted version of the triangulated axiom. And now let me mention what's the, the most important one for us is a weighted octahedron axiom. Just like the classic octahedron axiom, you start with two uh, triangles. So now I'm starting with two triangles with weights. The first triangle is uh, with weight R, which is this one. And the second one is uh, with weight S. Okay, and then I'm going to complete this triangle, uh, this diagram into the following diagram. So again, you have this weight R triangle here. Uh, you have a weight S triangle here. Now, what, what you can do is you have two extra triangle. Why is this one? The F a C F. Uh, this is one here, uh, and the other one is E C B, and uh, there's a shift uh, of E. And this tri triangle has weight zero, and you can see below there's no shift of this F. This triangle has a weight exactly R plus S. That's like the beauty of the, this proposition. So I uh, mentioned here that the way that we define, you can do there's a, there's many other way probably to define what the weight of a triangle is, but the way that we define the triangle to guarantee that we can prove proposition like this, such that the weight is behaving in an additive way. Okay, this is like the, like the I think this is one of the big achie achievement here. You can define some other uh, weight of a triangle, but I think we have it in a couple months ago. And when we go through the proof of this, we can also complete a triangle like this, but unfortunately the weight does not behave like, a, like additive. And then in the later, for later story, we cannot, uh, we cannot, we, it's, it's bad for, for us. Uh -huh. So we have to modify the definition, make sure that eventually we find some correct examples such that the weight is behaving just like our process. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to prove this. The proof is, uh, I think it's long. Um, <clears throat> and uh, right, so uh, one thing to be careful is that there's a, uh, this, this is a very weird diagram. Right? So the, the, the bottom one is not completely commutative. The very bottom one is commutative if you, somehow shift uh, to level uh, shift uh, R. So it means that this, this composition is not the same as this composition unless you, sh you, sh you shift further by R. Okay, <clears throat> but the good thing is all that is like the, the, the weight is, uh, is, is a sum. Okay, now the, uh, the reason why I'm, I'm doing this because I need to uh, use um, some machinery that was inspired from the Bjorn Cornell's, Cornell's uh, Lagrangian cobordium theory. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, something uh, related, related with the iterated cone decomposition. So uh, here is the uh, uh, definition. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> so C is a topological, it's a TPC, and X is an object that fixes its X. And I uh, also fix a family of the object in this category, X0 to Xn. And uh, um, uh, iterated cone decomposition denoted as a D of X with, re with respect to this uh, called linearization X0 to Xn is a family of, yes, of this triangle in C. I, 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 I give you the family in this way. And notice that all these triangles actually have certain with some weights, R1 to Rn. And uh, the weight of this entire cone decomposition is just the sum of all this, uh, uh, the weight of the triangles. Maybe some of them is zero, some of them not, just the sum of all of them. Does it give you a, a number? And uh, yes, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, how do you read this uh, triangle? Right? You start from the very bottom one to the top one. You start from X and you get like X N. So that X is can be viewed as a difference of X N and the Y N minus one. And this Y minus one is not important because Y minus one can be viewed as a, a difference of X N minus one and Y N minus two. And inductively it goes all the way back to Y one. The Y one is the difference of X one, X zero. So basically this all the y's is some intermediate step and eventually you can write x as some like a linear combination of x zero to x n. Okay. So I mean, uh, uh, this one way, what I just said is something like in the k zero group, you can just uh, go like this. But it's not a regress here because k zero group of a triangle of TPC is not well defined yet. 
and we actually have some trouble to define what K0 group of that. Um, because when you see some equivalence, these equivalences, again, need some weight. It's not just the equivalent itself. Um, but there's a, a schematic picture that probably will tell you uh, clear. So we have X, and this is like a linear linearization, X0 to Xn. And uh, for those who know what's Lagrangian cobordium theory is, right, if I put some pot potato in the middle, it will be some like a Lagrangian L with some uh, uh, linearization of L0 to Ln. Okay, the way of this to form it as this, like a tree picture, is that I can uh, concatenate or uh, uh, let's see how, how to say that, uh, a refinement of this, of this tree. If uh, I have a tree like this, X decomposed as, uh, or as a linearization of X0 to Xn, and it happens that some xi in the middle is also a linearization for some other a0 to ak. Then I can just replace this xi by this a0 ak and then put it inside. So we'll get a x as a linear combination of x0 and something also this and also a0 to ak and goes to xa. Okay, and this is basically what the picture says. And so what this really means is some called refinement of a cone decomposition, which is exactly what I just mentioned. So suppose X has a, a iterated cone decomposition of X0 to Xa, and the sum of Xi has a cone decomposition of some other A0 a to Ak, and then you will, well, this is a proposition, right? You can prove that X admit a iterated cone decomposition in the sense there's a lot of triangles uh, with respect to X0 to, to Xa, but with Xi replaced by A0 to Ak. And this is not important. Oh, okay, so this is, of course, this is important. But what is more important is that once you have this uh, uh, new refinement, refined linear linearization or cone decomposition, the weight of this refinement is actually the same as, as the sum of the weight of the original one plus the weight of this, this refinement of the, the, the small one. So W D prime, double prime, which is corresponding to this linearization, is D with this X0 to Xa, and this D prime is A0 to Ak. So again, this uh, uh, um, the weight behave like a additive. And I, I'm pretty sure that this additive comes from, because of the additive of uh, the weighted octahedron uh, uh, axiom. So if that is not behave like additive weight, then this is not behave like additive weight. I think in some moment in this project, uh, it's behave like two times that. So it will become two times this. Yeah, I mean, it's still fine, but uh, later you will see that it will cause some trouble if to, uh, our fragmentation pseudo metric. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and uh, one of the example that I uh, um, is exactly just this weighted octa octa axiom. I should give you an example of refinement. Um, okay, you, probably you don't remember the order of those letters, but uh, and it goes back probably goes back to this to see. So you see that the B can be written as some x difference of x and a, and again x itself can be written as some difference of e and f. Then what the theorem claims that your B can be written as a, you can put the B into two tr triangles, here and here. And this is exactly the definition of what's the, the cone decomposition of B with respect to uh, thing F, A, and E. Yeah. yeah. So Sorry, B that's is- how you, this WD is how you define the distance function as well, right? Or something like that. Right, WD is like the a, a certain, right, certain measurement of this uh, quantity de de decomposition. So you take like minimal WD for from A to B and B to A, and you sum them or something like that. I guess. Uh, sorry, can I sit, 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 sit again? Okay. Um, I, I think you're talking about his next slide, Boris. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah maybe, uh, yeah, maybe unclear what, what this question is. But okay, so this, this example is like I repeatedly say that this uh, weighted octahedron that actually give you an example of, of refinement. And the important thing is that the a weight behave like an additive. Let's see, is that compatible with what this proposition says? Okay, now, um, um, right, behave like an additive. Okay, now here comes the a definition of what uh, a DF, this fragmentation pseudo metric is. Uh, uh, again, so you will have a, a subset. So we have first have to fix a subset and, and the object set of a category. And uh, I will define some measurement between two things. Uh, 
So, um, okay, so I see that the uh, X and X prime are related by uh, iterated cone decomposition. In the way like uh, X prime is like one end and X is the other end. So it goes, goes to the picture here, there'll be X and some X prime appears here, but all other objects come from the chosen subset of a category. That's what I'm written here. And the position of X prime is actually not important. Uh, you can put the, uh, it's not important. Okay, now I'm going to consider all such uh, iterated cone decomposition. And for each of them, there's a weight I just mentioned, right? And I'll take the smallest weight I'm going to have, like the smallest energy that can decompose X into some linear combination of X, X prime with some other thing. Okay, now this gives you a number and this number is not necessarily symmetric. Actually, we have a question that if this really is not symmetric, we cannot find any, any example. But it, it, anyway, formally it's not symmetric. Uh, we put the definition DF just like, like, like uh, symmetrize that. Okay, now this will give you a, a number. Um, uh, some example here. Uh, suppose your family is extremely small. You only consider zero object inside. And you can check that the, the distance of that is more or less like uh, what's the smallest uh, uh, interleaving relation between X and X prime. Okay. And also the, another extreme case is if F is uh, all object. Uh, you can check that this distance is completely vanished. Maybe it's not that, that extreme. Maybe for some other subset of objects, it's also vanished. But, but at least you will see that sometimes it's just a completely a trivial metric. Okay, now, um, right, so a geometric motivation of this uh, DF is you see that uh, it's a come from cone decomposition, right? And it's a shadow metric from the Brown Cornell Shalukin's work, it's also come from. It's a cone decomposition, but in a slightly more geometric way. And I think our case is so like an alge algebraic analog of that. And also is an interesting question. I think we, we don't know that. Like which, which subset of this F we can take uh, such that this actually become a non-degenerate metric? I think we don't know that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, um, once you have this metric to define this uh, categorical entropy will be very easy. Uh, uh, suppose you have a, a uh, so this entropy is actually defined for functors, not for the object. Uh, so I'll give you a TPC, uh, I will get to consider a functor. And uh, again, suppose X zero is inside. Uh, and uh, the categorical entropy is like the growth rate. So you consider X, but you use this functor act on that repeatedly. Uh, and it will give you like a sequence of them. You consider the difference, how far it's away from this original X. And maybe it's, it grows very fast and divided by A. Uh, and it'll give you a certain number. And uh, well, of course you need to show that the number exists. It's independent of what this X you take. Um, well, that, that's it. And also for the H space things, right? The, the, by the definition H space is some continuous map, uh, like loop space, right? Charles-Solomon product maps loop, loop, compose a loop to another loop, right? Such that the, there's a, some identity element uh, behave like this. Yeah. And the key thing of that is you have to verify this map is continuous. And this is basically come from like the, um, right. so this is like part of the theorem that I mentioned at the beginning. And this actually come from a property that you need to verify that uh, here, what does this uh, uh, product, what does this mu actually behave? The mu behave just like sum, a direct sum to us. And you have to verify that there's, yeah, there's a property like this to guarantee that this uh, uh, map is, is a continuous map. Okay, this is basically, I, I think I, I, I just said, say, said all the ingredients in the main theorem. Uh, and uh, I think, I, I don't think I have much time left, right? Um, so, right, so uh, I think there's uh, only one small thing I, I would say. Uh, so once you pass to the limit category, so as I mentioned that in the limit category, there's, as I mentioned, there's R interleaving relation or here we call R isomorphism relation will become I isomorphism. So in the limit, you sort of kills all the torsion part, all the acyclic part. This is a nice thing and you don't worry too much about that. And then the, um, the, 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 the big theorem I need to show is that in the limit category is actually a triangulated category in, in a classic sense. It's really a triangulated category. And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip what's the, so the question is what is exactly triangle in this triangulated category? You need to verify exactly as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a very complicated definition of what's exactly triangle in this, in this infinity category. So, um, well, I just put here, and maybe you can, can re read this later. But uh, what I might mention that uh, is because of this C infinity comes from this uh, TPC, 
um, each of the uh, triangle, exact triangle I mentioned in C infinity, automatically admits some weight. And this weight is, uh, is induced from this weight of uh, TPC. So, so it means that in C infinity, the top of what's the weight of a triangle, even though it is uh, just classic tri triangulated category. And uh, once you can talk about the weight, then you can do exactly what we were doing earlier. You can talk about the cone decomposition, right? You can give the weight of the cone decomposition, and the weight, well, you can verify this, it satisfies the sub additive property, triangle inequality somehow, you see. And then you can have the fragmentation pseudo metric at the C infinity. Okay, then you can start to do this, uh, um, this uh, story like dynamics and topology of that. Uh, right? So now here comes the, the, uh, the punchline of this. Right? If in your life you mess some triangulated category in the classic sense, which can be realized as a C infinity of some TPC, then by what I just mentioned earlier, you can study the topology or dynamics of the, of the object set of this triangulated category. And this will be like a given. Uh, Completely open a new door that you can study like, like the, the, the dynamics or topology of this uh, category. Okay, yeah, yeah so, uh, I think I, right, I don't have time to talk about this. So I think uh, this is probably the, the place I need to stop. So, so let me just stop here. Uh, uh, thanks for, for the, uh, the attention. Uh, thank you very much. Lee. So, um, of course, feel free to ask uh, questions. Okay, the, I, I didn't check this chat, there's something. Uh, could you please return to entropy, to definition of the entropy? Mm. So c could you give an example of end of specific end of functor to which you want to apply this? Uh, for example, if you are, uh, so there's a natural family of functors that we have, which is just a shift function, right? Yeah. The sigma r. And uh, you, you can take my sigma a probably, sigma one probably, is shift by one. And you, you keep doing that, you have sigma a. So you just uh, keep shifting your object and you ask what's the, the distance here. And what we can show that the distance is no bigger than a. So this, this number is no, no bigger than one. Yes, but it could be, you see that it could be smaller, actually. It could be smaller than one, but I think the, uh, uh, I think it, under some condition, this is actually exactly equal to one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so let's say in this uh, Foucault category analogy, which Octave mentioned, so what would be an interesting factor to consider? Well, yeah, that, that, that's a part that we haven't tried yet. No, it's no. still in progress. Not quite. So there are, first of all, the, it's not just an analogy. So in some cases, we know that uh, up to maybe some technical issues having to do with uh, regularity, actually, of certain operations in the Fukaya category, but these are really some really minor issues, but uh, up to there. I did not mean to you. No, no, I know, no. Yeah, no, no yeah, but yeah. I, I, I want to say that it's basically, uh, you know, the fact that this is, this fits this description is basically in this long paper uh, with uh, Paul and uh, Egor. And uh, basically this says that uh, the Raifukaya category in the exact case when you take Lagrange objects, Lagrangians with primitives, in fact, uh, does give you uh, TPC in this sense. And then uh, and look as a functor, you can look at functors induced by Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. And you can see what, so you, there are many choices of functors that you could try to, uh, that are interesting in, ge in a geometric sense. Another uh, remark is that this um, uh, sort of uh, fragmentation pseudo metrics, in that case, we can show that they are actually metrics uh, with a correct choice of, uh, of this family. So the fa for instance, in the cotangent bundle, if you take a fiber and you include it into the category of all uh, compact Lagrangians as an additional object, and then you can use a fiber as a family. And in that case, you do get a metric. And in fact, in the unit cotangent bundle, the metric induced by this is uh, finite, which is, but you have to take the fiber with all primitives on it. 
which is a bit, it's not ideal in a way, but okay, this is how, how these things work. So, I mean, there are examples that actually uh, are very geometric and, you know. And in Hamiltonian, if you take indeed Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, can you prove that this is less circle than Hofer's metric? Right. This? So, yes. So this is the other side that Jun actually mentioned too, is that in all, in, in, the, uh, in the symplectic uh, sort of situation, all these pseudometrics uh, uh, have upper bounds that come from the Hofer metric and from even from Cobordis. So Cobordis is in between the Hofer metric and these bounds given by this. Uh, because what, what uh, Jun discussed is something that's purely algebraic. Uh, it's harder to bound things by uh, geometrically by shadows of Cobordis. So those would be bigger. And even bigger is the Hofer metric because that corresponds to a cobordis without ends, with just two ends, one, one. And, and, so, you, and so the lower bounds, uh, if you want to prove such pseudo uh, fragmentation, uh, uh, pseudo metrics are actually metrics, the lower bounds will come from holomorphic theory as usual. Mm -hmm. And the upper bounds come from the Hofer metric and mm -hmm. that's, that's where the thing fits. And then the choices of families are interesting because they can make certain distances that can be infinite, they can actually measure them. In other words, there are simple examples where you have non-isotopic or non-even uh, uh, homeomorphic uh, Lagrangians that are measured and with finite distance and, and things like this. And so you can measure things that are harder to, to estimate if you just use you know, like the voice set for this uh, set effron. And uh, the surprising part was that, in fact, for, I think, at least for me, it was, what was surprising is that it's a pretty general setup and you can apply it basically in all cases, and there are many, where you have filtrations on the space of morphs, basically. And, and the whole story is to, to sort of look at what means a triangle of higher weights than zero. So kind of how do you do cones by taking into account filtration? That, that's a basic thing. Sorry, Octav, maybe you answered the question and I missed it, but <clears throat> returning to the Fukaya category, if F is given by a Hamiltonian map, what would HF, what would, what would the entropy be then? I don't know. So I, unfortunately, uh, well, I, at least I didn't look into this. Maybe uh, Jun knows more, but uh, I, I didn't really look into it. Uh, I, I tried to do something different uh, in geometric terms with this construction. And I, for now, I, I don't know. Uh, can I ask a different question? Say, for instance, I start with a smooth proper category, like some, you know, square category of a closed surface, closed in higher genus two, the genus two surface. And that is a lame uh, persistent structure, I guess, that, where the filtration is just given by degrees. And then let's say I invert the self hunter on, on, on this thing. In a way, analogous to, analogous to, you know, wrapping, in a, in a way, analogous to taking a lecturer's vibration and then starting to wrap the, you know, the thimbles, et cetera. So, and if I, induce, if I start with a functor on this proper thing and then induce something on the bottom thing, will the entropy agree somehow? <clears throat> I'm, I'm letting uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I think it's uh, the entropy will, uh, will not increase, in a sense. Yeah. So, to some yeah, so, okay, so, so here, I mean, for this entropy, entropy is, is a, a, you, you certainly can define this, right? And the problem of that is, uh, uh, is uh, how to find a lower bound of that is actually a problem. Uh, so it's a, sort of easy to find what's the upper bound of that it is uh, by nature of the definition. Right? The lower bound, it seems not easy to find. So even though in, in the shift functor case, we like either shift by degree, as you said, or shift by whatever the filtration that, that we have, the, um, uh, we have to put some condition, a strong condition to make sure that uh, even for the shift functor, it is not that decrease, that vanish equals zero. Right. Yeah, for, for the you know, more concrete case, yeah, I, I haven't looked into this in, in detail. Yeah, sorry. Mm. 
uh, there are a number of other questions on the chat. Um, in any case, I want to tell you, uh, folks, I mean, uh, it's a new thing and we're still exploring all the possible constructions and uh, sort of uh, uh, cases in which you can compute. And uh, what we certainly know is that in the uh, Ukaya category situation, you have some relevant measurements uh, that, that give actually distances when the choices are uh, sort of natural. When you have Fukaya category, derived Fukaya categories with a clear set of generators, like for instance in the cotangent bundle or things like this, then all these measurements become actually effective and you can really see uh, how, uh, how they work. For this uh, categorical entropy, there are many other notions in these other papers uh, that uh, Jun mentioned, and this we haven't yet explored much. So it, it, it's a recent thing. So we, we'll see how that goes. And uh, okay, other questions. So uh, Jun, sorry, there are some questions I just saw from the chat. Right, uh, right. Where, where I should I start? I, um, some of these is answered. Well, I think the first one I see here is uh, of uh, semen about this notion of moduli of objects in DG categories following turn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just an optimistic question. I was just sort of, you know, you get these nice, well, they're not varieties, they're stacks, but you can extract some varieties out of them. I was just curious if your metric has anything to do with topology on those kinds of things. It might not, it might obviously not. That's all. If I can answer uh, this is that uh, we haven't looked into that yet, but it's a natural question to, to try to figure out. Uh, there are other spaces that show up in triangulated categories. For instance, there are classifying spaces in for triangulated categories of some sort. And it's also a question, what's the relation between the topology we get to those? So there are many questions like this that are for the moment uh, so at least I don't I don't know, but maybe you do, uh, Jun, uh, I, about no, this I, I probably related to the, uh, Probably don't know the question for the moduli space of objects. I mean, uh, sorry, but but uh, for the next question, I think I know how to. So Cheryl asked, why well, this is vanished when you take f to be everything. I think this is uh, easy because you can uh, you can complete the uh, right. So so the. So by the definition of the, um, the DF, right, you're counting basically the weights of triangles. But uh, um, if F is everything, then you can basically complete the triangle inside C0. Then you basically consider all the triangles as with zero. Because everything in C0, every triangle in C0 is with zero. So you add up all the zero is zero. So that, that, that <coughs> that's the reason why this is zero. Um, so in other words, in, uh, by, by these axioms, uh, the identity is always going to be of width zero. And so yeah. you have a simple triangle that uh, has just one object on the other side. Instead of F0, F1, you'll have just X. Okay, so there's one more question about this uh, being, being uh, uh, okay, so yeah, there, there, I was planning to say something about the marking category, but it's, uh, it's not easy. I'm, I'm not sure how long it will take, but uh, so I think I, there's a very short paragraph I prepared at the very end of this talk. I'm not sure if it's actually worthwhile to explore. Um, so I, okay, let's read. So example of the trial TPC is from Tomakin category. It's a, um, uh, so first it's a well-defined derived category. So you can talk about like the tri triangles there. But the, remember, um, no, sorry, uh, Tomakin category is a category of uh, um, not manifold itself, it's a manifold cross R. So you automatically have the shift function by playing with this R. So the object itself is uh, admit some shift. So you can actually embed this, this uh, category inside some category of persistent modules. So in a category of persistent modules, you can um, define, um, uh, <coughs> so, uh, so it is, Yeah, so right. So the Tamaki category is itself when you serve as C0, and by using the shift functor, you can upgrade C0 to C by using whatever the shift that you want. Yeah. Um, then, uh, <coughs> yeah, you see, what's the question? Is C infinity of Tamaki can be localized with a torsion object? Um, 
Uh, I think, yes, uh, when you localize, you kill this torsion object. So C infinity basically is high in category with, without the uh, torsion object. And the TC is a shifting function. Yes, the TC, well, we know how to define TC is, yes, is a shifting functions. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm, can I ask a different question if I ask too many questions? No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, for instance, say I, you know, change my bound with everything by bound with Hamiltonians. So that I think the barcode changes by, but by bound with amount. So you don't, cons you don't set up the notion of equivalence of two such things. So, so that this finite barcode shifts, et cetera, are also like, counted or? By saying that you can define that uh, well, considering something invariant of the, for instance, of of a, a you know level manifold or something like that, mm. without choosing specific Hamiltonians. So, um, so basically, uh, uh, these filtrations, their pur pur their purpose is really to uh, see. Uh, even small barcodes when they show up. But uh, if you work under filtration R, the barcodes that are smaller in length th than R will be uh, neglected, basically. They will not show. So in other words, you, you can think again about Morse functions. And uh, may, imagine that for a Morse function, you make a little perturbation and in, introduce two additional critical points, one that hits the other one. <laughs> you know, one of index K, one of index K minus one. And the difference in action between them is uh, three. <laughs> That's what I should say. So then this is, a modification by a barcode of high three, height three, kind of, ki kind of something. And uh, this is equivalent to what we call a, a three acyclic. And somehow that's how this thing is seen. So if you work, you know, it depends what you, where you work with this filtration are. And the equivalence and everything is, it's modeled on this somehow. Do you have any kind of vision what could be isometry theorem in this context? Yeah, so, um, uh, I think we thought about that. We're actually trying to uh, adapt this barcode theory inside. But the problem with that is uh, you are not dealing with one persistent module. You are dealing with like a, a whole family of persistent modules. So it's not quite sure that you might, we might define some like uh, interleaving distance between uh, triangles. Uh, if possible, uh, uh, at this moment, this is for us is is not quite uh, uh, clear how this is defined, or not on the level of objects or triangles. So you can define if you have one TPC, you have another TPC, right? Then you can try what's the quantum relation of two TPCs mm -hmm. by some like uniform uh, uh, interleaving things. Yeah, uh, when at, at least to me, I'm not sure uh, how, how this works. So I think so, no, I mean, there are some uh, really uh, uh, sort of uh, interesting questions there in, of a different sort. So for instance, you could say, let's look at an example that we now know works, which would be like the cotangent bundle. And let's look at some of these pseudo metrics there and they induce a topology. So the first question that would be interesting would be already, uh, how different is a topology depending on this family a front that's picked? Maybe these topologies are actually equivalent. The conjecture, for instance, is that if you are in a very small neighborhood of any object in this topology, then uh, it's a Hofer uh, topology only that applies. It is all things that are very close are in fact Hamiltonian isotopic to the object itself. So there are all sorts of questions like this. They, they fit extremely well with the Arnold uh, nearby Lagrangian conjecture with all sorts of things with uh, Claude's uh, conjecture about, uh, you know, the bounds for spectral norm. M many things fit extremely well in this setup. Uh, so 
one direction would be to understand better a little bit this, this, uh, this topology. Uh, and what Jun is saying, of course, it's important too, in a way, because when you start to really do these constructions, they come in, you know, you, you have many of these categories, maybe you need to compare them. Okay. So, uh, Um, in any case, um, we, <laughs> we took a long, uh, we, uh, it's, it's great. So let's thank uh, June again and uh, 